Hello, Andrew. Thanks for speaking to me. Could you please start by telling me a bit about your background and current role? Sure. Um, I'm currently a comprehensive ophthalmologist and um, an eye pathologist, but uh, for the last seven years I have also served as the technology liaison and advisor for the American Academy of Ophthalmology. I also um, have served with them now as the Ophthalmic News and Education Network um, as the deputy editor-in-chief. It is an educational in the news portal that reaches out to um, 100,000 ophthalmologists worldwide. And in addition to that, I have uh, helped them with uh, social implementation of a professional network, like a social media network for the Amer American Academy of Ophthalmology, as well as the, the iWikipedia. And, and currently now, I have um, several internet companies, and um, I help uh, physicians with their search engine optimization, search engine, optim uh, search engine management, as well as uh, online reputation. Um, and try to clean up the, the mess out there that the Internet has caused for, for physicians. Your book, The Biggest 24, is about trying to help anyone achieve their full potential in this digital age. What inspired you to write this book, and why do you think this issue is so important? Right. Um, and so my background, about 10 years ago, for nearly about 10 years during med school when I was relatively, um, did not know how to focus my time, I, I was a um, quote-unquote video game addict. And, and I literally played probably 40, 50 hours a week just wasting my time on the Internet and um, playing these online games. And what I didn't realize was that I was just, you know, um, with technology and with, with the ability to get distracted, if one didn't know how to master technology, it was very easy to be, um, to be under the uh, slavery of technology. And so... Uh, what happened was in 2004, during my residency at the University of Iowa, um, I had to go cold turkey because I was developing carpal tunnel in my, my hands, and it was uh, difficult to do surgery. Then I realized I was really destroying my life. And, and at the time, during that time, I had, you know, marital problems and stuff. And all this is going to come out of my, my first book, which is Hooked on Games. And, and what, I, what happened there, my marriage was ruined, and, and you know, I was, everything was, was in ruin. But my wife and I agreed to reconcile, and we decided to, um, you know, start going to church, and, and, and that's when I started applying new principles in my life, which is what I call biblical principles, you know, from what I learned, and I discovered that, you know, everyone has a purpose. And so when I stopped cold turkey, I had 40 hours a week. My purpose then was I felt like I, I, I can use my talents to educate other people about ophthalmology, um, um, learn how to to publish books and, and reach, you know, the masses uh, to teach them how to do, you know, better things. And what I discovered was when I applied 40 to 50 hours a week into, um, into web design and search engine optimization and learning the Internet, I created this website for University of Iowa called iRounds, right, iRounds.org. And, and at the time, it was still in the early stages of Internet publishing, so none of the faculty would want to, you know, contribute or didn't want to... Um, didn't really want to um, buy that that's a or buy into that's a real uh, mechanism of of publishing. But what I discovered was that when I published with with SEO SEM, I was able to appear on the first page of Google, and because of that, people recognized my name as a resident, and and they were able to recognize the University of Iowa, and then we started attracting patients from afar. They wanted to come for surgery. They wanted to come for advice. They they emailed you know the the webmaster, which, which was me. And so that gave me the idea of creating um, a publishing company called Free Educational Publications International, which then sprouted out medrounds.org. And, and so basically um, it, what I discovered was that if I could be on the first page of Google, you can literally market, sell anything, market an idea, sell, it, sell an idea, or sell a product or service. And so for the last, you know, since 2004, that's what I've been focusing my time into is learning how to, to apply this to business and how to apply that to medicine to help, you know, um, change and mold medicine. And what I discovered was what, uh, oh, what I discovered over the last seven years was really when I focused my, my energies into a, a, a useful purpose, a God-honoring purpose, I was then able to really time manage well. And so I wanted to write a book to help other people because I realized that with technology, Moore's law dictates that roughly about every two years, 
the number of transistors on a microchip is going to double. And because of that, things are going to get uh, microchips are going to get smaller, and and technology is going to get faster. And that means devices are going to get smaller and smaller, and we're going to get more inundated with information, videos, audio, and text on or, or written works online. So the graph is log logarithmic. So if you don't know if if a doctor doesn't know how to manage, or a person doesn't know how to manage their their time very well in the digital age, we only have 24 hours a day. That person can easily get sucked up into, you know, other activities that are going to usurp up all their free time, all their enjoyable time slots, and therefore there's no time left for innovation. And that's what happened to me in internet video gaming: is that I spent 40 to 50 hours a week playing games. I didn't create anything. I quit, and I create three companies um, out of that, mm -hmm. and then also built an eye clinic. So I have four companies now out of seven years. So that's why I wanted to write that book is to help others achieve their full potential because really the, the conclusion of the book says there's, there's only two purposes in life really is, is to leave a, 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 a long-lasting legacy that, that can, can really impact our society. And number two is to touch people in a positive way as we traverse and pursue our God-given dreams because you know, that's what it's about, right? Interactions with people and building things that can affect social change. And what are the biggest challenges in using social media as a physician, and what can be done to overcome them? Yeah, the main challenges of, of using social media for a physician is, one, how to use it effectively, effectively to reach your target audience, because the Internet really reaches the entire world, right? So, um, so is there a target-focused group they want to reach um, specifically, and, and figure out how to reach that, that targeted audience? For example, if you're in Southern California, and you want to run a social media campaign, really, you know, are you trying to reach the entire world? Are you trying to reach all the all the people in the United States and the Western Hemisphere, um, or just you know, 30 mile radius around your area? So that's 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 one issue. The number two is actually learning how to use technology because a lot of physicians are behind in technology use, and so they really don't know how to use it properly. I have colleagues who don't understand Facebook or Twitter. And because of that, they are so scared to even use it or get on it. Social media also involves managing websites that allows patients to interact with the physician, meaning that you know, they're able to comment, they're able to review a, a physician's services. Physicians are very scared of negative feedback because negative feedback can actually uh, hurt a practice or really damage one's um, uh, reputation online. So physicians have stayed away from it. But the problem of doing that is that the Internet is still advancing forward and allowing patients to interact with doctors regardless if the doctor is ready to interact or not. So therefore, that means if a doctor is practicing, they're going to have third-party websites that allows patients to post comments. And the, the truth is, is that if a, if a doctor is practicing long enough, and if they see thousands of patients a year, there's going to be angry patients. And those angry patients with an ax to grind are the ones that are most likely to go online and post really negative comments. And uh, a case in point, last month in outpatient surgery, there was a patient who was upset with her plastic surgery and posted tons of negative comments online. The plastic surgeon uh, lost surgery because patients would search his name, find the, find the comments, and would cancel surgery on, on the physician. Mm -hmm. So he is a almost have to uh, sell his practice. He had to sell his home to keep the practice open. And uh, he actually took her to court. He won. The court told her she had to remove all the negative comments online, find her uh, several tens of thousands of dollars. However, she killed herself with two weeks, or two weeks before the verdict. So he is still stuck with some negative comments online. So those are the kind of things that make physicians really scared of, of entering social media. So how can physicians overcome this? Well, we need more physician leaders to rise and to who are familiar with, with social media and to teach other doctors how to use social media effectively. Uh, we need services, companies that help doctors manage their uh, social media online. Uh, the reason why is because of the biggest 24. We only have 24 hours a day. So if a doctor is making, let's say, you know, several hundred dollars an hour, maybe four, you know, $500 an hour, 
is it worth his or her time to manage their own social media campaign? I would argue no. Something I learned long ago is that if you can pay someone else um, less money to manage something that would cost you more money, it's better to pay that person to manage that, um, that particular service or activity because that allows you to then effectively utilize your time or other, other things to expand your, your, you know, your, uh, your purpose, achieve your goals, or um, run your practice. In your opinion, how can pharma better engage with physicians? You know, I think pharma can do a, a can run social media campaigns. And something that that I have seen is that even the older doctors who were resistant of of these new technologies and internet um, uh, things uh, that 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 evolve are now using the um, the internet for social media. And it's 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 pretty it's really amazing to see how they're they're online even when they are much, much older. And so pharma could run a social media channel on Facebook or Twitter and allow physicians to get updated information about um, pharmaceuticals and new technologies and allow the, the physician to tap in when they are ready and when um, they want that information uh, during a convenient time for them. And that's what social media affords. It's really a, a on-demand method of allowing people to tap into a channel when they are most ready to, to read or to listen or to learn. In a recent podcast, you said that negative reviews of medical practices and businesses can actually be a positive in terms of raising brand awareness. Why is this? Yeah, there was a business paper published by Stanford Business School in, I think, 2010 that talked about the positive effects of blemishes. And they were referring to uh, review, reviews and testimonials. Uh, the, the problem with testimonials is that uh, when doctors aggregate or pharma aggregate testimonials on their own website, what they do is they only pick the positives. So when you're a consumer and you go online and you see all these positive testimonials, they seem you know, fake, they seem screened, and they don't seem genuine. So people don't really believe those testimonials. But if your product or service is truly good, what's going to happen is kind of like the eBay effect, uh, is that you're going to generally get mostly positives and a few negatives. The few negatives, let's say the negative rate is like 1 in 100 reviews, makes your practice or your service or even your, your, um, your pharmaceutical product more realistic and more genuine and honest because now uh, patients and, and also customers will know that it's not true that someone is going to get all perfect fives and all perfect reviews. But when they see a few blemishes in there, it brings honesty, transparency, and, and basically makes your service and product look real to the consumer and patient. And finally, in what ways do you think that physicians and the healthcare industry could work better together in the future to improve patient care? You know, there's, there's areas in research that, that would allow um, quicker feedback to the, to the pharmaceutical companies about medicines, side effects, um, and, and efficacies of a drug. There could be better collaborations using, using the Internet to design better, better uh, products and, and pharmaceuticals. So um, the, the amazing thing is that with the Internet and with the, the advance in technology and communications, all these things will be possible. And uh, let me give you an example. So back in the early 1800s, or when, when Lewis and Clark, um, when um, President Jefferson told Lewis and Clark to go explore the United States for new plants, for new, um, for new um, animals, for new land, it literally took months and sometimes even half a year for that information to come back to the president because everything had to travel by horseback. Then with the advent of the telegraph, it got faster and, and, and radio and so forth. But now with the Internet, it's almost instantaneous, right? We got on the inter Internet and how, for example, uh, and through telephone technologies, you and I are able to communicate, but we're halfway around the world. So in essence, with Internet technologies, we're now able to, for example, analyze MRI scans from around the world. We're able to do da Vinci robotic surgery around the world using Internet technologies and satellite technologies. 
So as these technologies advance, we are going to be, to be able to enter a worldwide collaboration in research, in education, and improving patient care at an unprecedented rate. Thank you for speaking to me today, Andrew. It's been great to hear your thoughts. Oh, you're welcome.